Game of Thrones Season 7, the full season review. I am here with Aaron Samuel, the monkey. I am Bo Oliver, the blue cricket cockroach alien thing. I don't know. You determine it. Use your imagination. You have a ambiguity. lot of titles, man. I- I'm like Daenerys. I'm kind of like John. I'm just like uh, Aaron the monkey. That's it. No romance, though. You sure about that? I'm seeing other people. I'm seeing other monkeys. Hey, I mean, kind of. You been to the zoo lately? <laughs> Got some sexy monkeys. <laughs> So, Game of Thrones Season 7, I would say it's... Most fans have seemed to enjoyed it. To me, this season is probably the weakest season, but I think I, I still enjoyed it. I still anticipated every Sunday night to watch my favorite show of all time. When you're rating it on the scale of TV in general, it's probably one of the better things on TV this Right, right year. after Twin Peaks. But, uh, okay, I'll, I'll catch up, I'll, I'll let you know. Okay, uh, both seasons on Netflix. But when you compare it to Game of Thrones as a whole, it's definitely one of the weaker seasons, and I think a lot of people enjoyed it, I enjoyed it, but it wasn't as, I guess, as seamless as seasons past. A lot of people had problems with certain things throughout the season, uh, certain storylines, certain logic that was used, but that doesn't totally ruin the season for me. I think I just kind of expected a little more from certain parts, certain characters, but... Well, I thought this was going to be their best season. Because season six was so good, and I thought, this is when we go beyond the wall. This is the Great War, the prelude, really, to the Great War. And my expectations were so high for this season. But I think, like everything in art, there's good things and there's bad things. I think we're going to be fair and balanced uh, with this review. Is, this, is, that, is that a slogan that's been used? Fair and balanced? I don't think so. I think, we, I think we can use it. Well, if anybody who does use it, you have to be fair and balanced. Yeah, and obviously with Game of Thrones, the production value is fantastic. Great actors, great action. So Great cameos. Uh, Ed Sheeran, Noah Syndergaard from the Mets. First strike he threw all year. Well, I, I even heard that they were going to get Conor McGregor to be on the show, and I guess that didn't work out. I wouldn't have yeah, been opposed to that. I wonder what that would have been like if Conor McGregor was on Game of Thrones. Who the fuck is Jon Snow? Why the hell should he be king of the north? I should be king of the north. Don't you know I'm half stuck? He's a bastard. Shut your fucking mouth, Davos. I'll slap the shit out of you. I should be king in the north. I'll knock Jon Snow out inside two rounds. Mark my words. Rick on Targaryen is your daddy? I'm your daddy, Jon Snow. Shut up, you'll do nothing. I'll take the Night's King out right now. The Night's King, he, he doesn't have the power I possess. I should be. I'm a full fighter. The Night's King only has two moves. I'm all around. That's real fighting, Jon Snow. Spears, swords, bow and arrows. Nothing. I think the best place to start with Cersei and Jamie's relationship in season seven is the last scene that they share together, where Jamie finally leaves Cersei. It's something that we Jamie supporters have wanted to see since about season three when he was running around Westeros with Brienne. But it's a very powerful and emotional scene for both characters. I think we finally see Jamie realize that Cersei may not be the person that he thinks he's in love with. I think it's kinda of ridiculous that it took him it's kinda of ridiculous that it took an army of dead people coming after I mean, she's done all the terrible things in the past, but Do you think he was heartbroken? Because the thing that made him really leave was when she threatened him and, and he said, I don't believe you, he basically calls her bluff. And he walks away. Yeah, I think he's heartbroken, but I think at this point, like we see it too when he tries to kill Daenerys during the battle is, I think at this point of his arc, he's more focused on doing the right thing rather than just blindly follow and do what's best for, I guess, his house. I mean, obviously killing Daenerys is best for his house, but it also would end the war. Right, he's a big picture guy. He realizes the real threat is north, no matter what squabbles they have between Lannister, Stark, Targaryen, etc., that I think now he realizes the real the real battle is to the north and we need to do what we can to help to help ensure the survival of Westeros <laughs> of humans. Yeah, I think in the beginning of that scene too, when Cersei walks in to talk with him and Jamie is talking with all of his men and he's kind of game planning for how they're going to travel north and how they can help Daenerys and John. And Cersei says, Can you guys give me a minute with my brother? Just the look on Jamie's face, he looks so proud. It's a fight that he can believe in. He says to her, It's not about houses, it's not about Stark and Lannister, it's about the living and the dead. 
And Jamie is somebody who's always tried to end wars quickly. He doesn't want to prolong war. He wants to negotiate, to use diplomacy. Like the scene we see with him in season six with Blackfish. I think it did break his heart in a way because their relationship, it's so fucked up. It's so complicated. The fact that I don't think Jamie needs Cersei anymore. And Cersei definitely doesn't need Jamie because she's finally in a position where she's the queen. She's the one with maximum power. That's what she always saw in Jamie, that power that she would never have. But she looked a little heartbroken, too. I would argue that Jamie needs Cersei more than Cersei needs Jamie at this point. Yes. Because if, when you look at Jamie, I mean, they had that, he had that nice moment with Tyrion, and I thought that was a fantastic scene, even though the logic around it wasn't really the best. But I still thought, you know, anytime Nikolai Costa-Walder and Peter Dinklage are toe-to-toe in a scene, it's fantastic. But I think, although like they seem to kind of make amends, I think that bridge is pretty much broke, uh, burnt. I never saw Jamie just hopping onto the side of the Starks or the Targaryens, like, supporting and going against Cersei he would as much as he may dislike Cersei or even in the books when he's kind of just over it I never pictured him joining the opposite side fighting to take overthrow Cersei and take her down I think I alluded to it a bit on the finale video where I never saw Jaime fully turning to the good side he knows it might be the right decision and he knows Cersei may be pure evil but I don't think he can bring himself to fully going against her he may he may stray and do his own thing or try to do what's right but as far as whose side he's on i think he's always for the lannisters what about the pregnancy how do you think that plays into season eight do you think she's actually pregnant at first i didn't but now i'm kind of leaning towards it unless she's just trying to play everybody um i don't really know what the pregnancy does for her for Cersei, as far as it pertains to Jaime and Tyrion, she could be trying to play them somehow using, I guess, the pregnancy to make her look not weak, but as having something to live for. So they might see her as trying to survive the war rather than be reckless. Meanwhile, maybe she is trying to be reckless. I mean, a lot of people are saying maybe she told Tyrion about it because he wanted Tyrion to sympathize with her and kind of come back towards her side. Do I think she's pregnant? Yes. Do I think the baby will ever be born? No. You think the prophecy does come true with Jaime ultimately? killing Cersei eventually. I, I, I'm starting to think, I'm starting to, to lean against it, honestly. I mean, we've point. seen D&D bring up stuff and just totally disregard it later on. So, I mean, it wouldn't surprise me if the baby's born or her prophecy with Maggie the Frog doesn't come completely true. It feels like something where they wouldn't want to ruin Jamie's redemption arc. Maybe they were thinking towards the future when they did that scene in season five. We're not going to include this line because maybe the audience would rather see Daenerys kill Cersei or Tyrion kill Cersei. Maybe something that's more mainstream and less tragic and Shakespearean that we would see in the books. And now especially bringing in the pregnancy. I do think she's pregnant. I think at first it could have been seen as a way to keep Jamie on her side. The thing about Jamie, you said like they don't want Jamie to ruin his redemption arc. I pictured in my head the ending for Jamie is him ultimately ruining his redemption arc because he just couldn't stray away from his family and Cersei and his loyalties. Even though he knew the right thing is to maybe is to go with Daenerys or to stop Cersei, I think ultimately he would make a decision that would lead to his downfall, risking it all for Cersei or him taking it on himself to destroy Cersei rather than just fully become a good guy. So I'm still not sure if Cersei or Jaime is your favorite character. Can you definitively tell me which one it which one it is? Uh I could say for hundred percent certainty that in the book Jaime is hundred percent my favorite. And the show with Cersei? Uh, it's very close. I mean, I've always been a Jamie guy, but I love what Cersei brings more. I'll root for Jamie in the show, but I love what Cersei brings to the show too much. Well, you made a great point once where you talked about everybody's arcs have suffered in specific seasons, not Cersei. Cersei's arc seems to only be growing stronger, and in season seven, it looks like she really took on the role as the lioness of House Lannister. What Tywin Lannister was doing in the earlier seasons is what Cersei is doing now. See, books uh, show Cersei so much better than books, Cersei. Well, she's much smarter. Very smart. Yes. Uh, there's been a lot of dumbing down of characters. She's been smartened. Yeah, they've been... Tremendously. They didn't have to nerf Cersei. And I think the best part about it, because in the books, we, we get the inner monologue and how she always wanted to be born a boy, how she could be do better than Jamie and better than Tywin. And in the show, it's kind of manifesting into that, where she is absolutely meant to rule. I mean, she... I mean, for the hand she's dealt, she's been doing a pretty... Pretty good job, I mean. Well, some of my favorite scenes in this season, her and Mycroft Holmes, the representative from the Iron Bank, um, especially that first conversation where the representative, um, Taicho Nestoris, I think his name is, he's talking about which side he's going to bet on. And Cersei gives him that line, you guys are the greatest bettors in the world. And he says, we don't make bets, we make calculated decisions. And she's like, yeah, fancy word for saying bet. And she hits him with the, the eyebrow, the rock eyebrow. One of the best dramatic scenes 
because it is Cersei being like her father. And she makes the point to the representative that banks don't do well with revolutionaries, and that's what Daenerys is. And the way that she was able to get him on her side, I think, was very impressive, and it's very Tywin-esque. Yeah, I mean, in the books, I mean, there's a famous line when... uh these, this show is based on books? Yeah. Okay. I, I, you have to bring it up at least twice during every review. <laughs> You're uh, paid to say that. Famous line to Jamie is saying that Tyrion is ty- mostly like Tywin's son. Uh, but in the show, it's Cersei. She's very Tywin esque. No, like. yeah, she's very Tywin. I don't think Tywin was an evil man, but he was. He did the necessary evils. Yes. Where Cersei is, she'll take some liberties with her, her, her evilness. Right, but even decisions in the past, um, you know, people blame Cersei for the death of Ned, but she didn't want to kill Ned. She didn't kill the babies. She didn't try to kill Tyrion during the Blackwater. They changed that. Um, uh, whatever, no. <laughs> <laughs> this show was based on books? <laughs> the biggest, like, proponent for Cersei is that Lena Headley is probably the best actor on the show, hands well, down. Well, another great dramatic scene with um, Indira Varma, the actress who plays Ilarius and Just such emotion in that scene between these two characters. Characters that hate each other. Characters that are willing to do the same thing to each other, but hate when it's done to them. And the acting on both sides there just shows how strong these two actresses are. Well, the best scenes, the best dramatic scenes in the whole se- uh, whole season were, I think, Tyrion and Cersei at, in the finale. And yeah, another great scene. That scene as well. Pretty much anything Lena Headey's in. Uh, if she doesn't win an Emmy this year, then I, I don't know what to say anymore. I can make an argument that she's one of the best actresses ever on any TV show, and she has been <laughs> shown no love for it at all. In the scene where she's torturing Ilaria Sand, it's a, it's a hard scene to watch because you imagine what that torture would be like just sitting in a dungeon watching your own kid rot for the next couple That's of years. <laughs> Fucking brutal, man. It's, it's pretty dark. But I kind of felt sympathetic for Cersei, which is something that I don't really do. I felt sympathetic for her during her walk of shame. But when she asks Alaria, why did you take her from me? That's, I was going to say the exact same thing. Yeah. Because what, what those two scenes have in common with the Tyrion scene and the Alaria scene is both scenes she has a moment where she kind of breaks what she's doing. When she says that to Alaria. And you took her from me. Why did you do that? And then you see with Tyrion and Cersei, when Tyrion brings up the kids and talks about how much he, he loved his niece and nephew, she also breaks character again, too. She snaps at him when she brings it up. It's like, she snaps back at him, I will not have it. I will not hear it, not from you. I will not hear it! It's such a great little moment, and I think Lena Heaney plays the, both scenes very well, where so calm and collected one moment, and just a little tick sets her off, and then she goes right back to calm and collected again and goes forward with it. Yeah, where she, she has doesn't these miss little, a beat, man. Where she has these little breaks where so much emotion goes through, bringing up her dead children, the memory of them. It kind of felt like she was kind of numb to it, but you could still tell that it's still buried back there, and when it comes out, she gets really emotional about it. But she's able to be collected, kind of Tywin-esque at times, where she doesn't let emotions play into part of her decisions or the way she presents herself. Yeah, and I think these two characters, their arcs, their relationship in Season 7 is the best part of Season 7. It's been the best part of a lot of seasons, really. And Jamie gives a great performance, I think, one of his best performances during the Spoils of War episode when Daenerys attacks the Lannister army. The whole way that that battle was shot from the very onset where Bronn hears the Dothraki stampeding in the distance, and it's not like they swarm them out of nowhere, they lead up to it. It's almost about one or two minutes of just Dothraki hooves stampeding in the background and they're just slowly slowly approaching them the entire army is freaking out they're making formations bronze telling jamie get back to king's landing no we can hold them off and then you hear Rah! that's my that's my drogon impression <laughs> Second, good. Yeah. I, I'm not I do a good Drogon, do a good Jon Snow. I'm not asking you to forget you're dead. And then he sees, I mean, it's just, the way they shot that battle from his perspective was a great move, rather than Daenerys' perspective. Yeah, because it's easy when you see it from Daenerys' perspective, because it's been leading up to this, her taking Westeros with the Dothraki, the dragon, she's ready to go. But when you see it from Jamie's perspective, you're kind of taken back a little about the destruction and mayhem. If it's just Daenerys going against an army of Lannisters, you're rooting for them to burn and basically turn to ash. When it's from Jamie's perspective and he's kind of shocked and scared and just chaos all around him, you kind of sympathize with not only Jamie, because I think by now I think most people sympathize with Jamie, but with just the Lannister men in general, where it's not a triumphant victory, it's a massacre. And 
I think when you view it from Jamie's perspective, you you get all of that. Well, it's it's Jamie Lannister and his army fighting against a weapon that's out of time. This is a weapon that should not be in medieval times. It's almost like having an Apache helicopter in the middle of a medieval battlefield. And they they even take some of the shots from Apocalypse Now, that famous shot, um, and then they replaced it with Drogon. It's just ridiculous for him to have to face this in battle. And Jamie's a character who's not one for war. He doesn't want to prolong war. And the, the decision he makes at the end of the episode to try and kill Daenerys is a decision that backfires, but you can see from where he's coming from that he just wants this to end. He cannot take the destruction, ashes blowing in the wind, his men running around, dying in front of him. It's too much for him. Well, it's twice this season where he's trying to think of the greater good. One, when he tries to kill Daenerys and end the war, and later on when he wants to take the Lannister men up north to take on the White Walkers. And I think the great part about that scene as well is when you see Tyrion's perspective of the war. You kind of see the same emotion and like just disgust and fearfulness from Tyrion as you did Jaime. You see the same perspective from opposing sides, and I thought that was an amazing job by the director to capture both Jaime's and Ty- Tyrion's emotions because he's watching his own family, his own men, men, he grew, uh, men that grew up serving him being absolutely absolutely dismantled by a dragon and it shows that both characters they they're always compared to Tywin that they have empathy that Tywin lacked that in battle Tywin would just see this as business as usual but Tyrion and Jaime they can see these people as individuals with families with people that they love that they're just not numbers they're not just nameless soldiers they're actual human beings and it's it's tough on them and I think that's what makes them two of the best human characters and relatable characters on the show. I mean, not all these men deserve to be burned to ash in a split second. It's war, but he can still sympathize with the fact that War. Huh. What is it good for? Absolutely nothing. It- he was going to execute me. He knew I was innocent. He didn't hate me because of anything I did. He hated me because of what I am. A little monster sent to punish him. Did he, did, he think, did he think I wanted to be born this way? Did he think I chose What do you want? Tyrion, Tyrion, Tyrion. What have you done for me in the past three seasons? <laughs> Not a lot. Drink and know things, right? He drinks and he knows things. Yeah, I mean, Tyrion really hasn't had much to do the past few seasons. And I feel like, in a way, he's gotten, much like Littlefinger, a little dumbed down by the writing and the events that have taken place. When you think of all the bad decisions he's made, look to Marine, and now, in this season, when he gets the Greyjoys, Mortels, and then... And you see Daenerys start doubting him a little bit this season, where his allegiances are, if he still loves his family, and things of that nature. In this season, he serves as the bridge between Daenerys and Jon, really. He's the one that gets them on the same page in episode three. That is the common link between them. Those scenes between Jon and Tyrion in season one were amazing. That relationship, you have the Stark bastard, the Lannister dwarf. You know, they're outsiders, and they share that. That helps them come together in this season. But he's almost become a glorified advisor. And you have to think, was this always going to be his role at the end of the show? Because he's not a warrior. He's probably not a chosen one. He might be a Targaryen. It it doesn't seem like there's much for him to do anymore. Well, the thing is, what he was always great at is playing the game playing the politics of Westeros. It's on full display and done beautifully in season two. Yes. There's none of that. Two. There's none of that anymore because when the story rushes along, there's not these little things and little political maneuvers he can do. Especially in war. Yeah, exactly. It's just not as exciting. And his decisions he's made so far, I mean, they haven't really gone his way. That's supposed to be what he's good at, and he's failing at that. I don't know if it's the show dumbing him down. I don't know what George has in mind for Tyrion's character moving forward. Much what Littlefinger is, there's no story to be had within the little politicking in the game and playing the Westerosi game, the Thrones, pretty much, and it kind of just brushes over the small aspects and focuses on the decisions that backfire in him just cause, are caused just for Daenerys and Tyrion to have this little riff not necessarily a riff but just to have a differencing of opinions and he seems with Daenerys to be very keen on the idea of breaking the wheel that they discussed in season five and every time he brings it up to her now Daenerys seems to shy away from talking about it maybe because she's afraid of her own mortality maybe she's going away from that but the scene in uh, Beyond the Wall, when they talk about Daenerys' successor, I thought that was one of the most interesting scenes of the season, to, th- to think about what the world is going to look like after Game of Thrones. Well, that could be his next big play, like his vision for 
Westeros going forward is to have this sort of democratic system in place. And that could be his next, I guess, his game or his next play or what he sees fit for Westeros, breaking the wheel, not having a dynasty of ruler after ruler of one family where you don't know, especially with the Targaryens or Lannisters with the whole incest thing, whether they're crazy or sane. And then one king can be great and, and Westeros can show great prosperity and growth. And then the next ruler just can be can be the complete opposite and destroy all that growth where you need a solid system in place where you can have continued growth. And I think that's what he kind of means by breaking the wheel. Yeah, and he also tries to tame Daenerys' impulses in this season. The decision for Daenerys to burn um, Randall Tarly and Dickon Tarly is a decision that he did not agree with. People have been speculating for how many years. Is Daenerys going to be the Mad Queen? I, j- I just don't see it from Tyrion's perspective. I think they kind of played up the decision t- for Daenerys to burn Randall Tarly as this impulsive and rash decision. It wasn't that crazy to me. When talking about the successor, people go to the scene with Cersei and Tyrion, which was, we talked about that when we spoke about Cersei and Jaime. The scene between those two characters, Peter Dinklage, I mean, it just shows that he might be the best actor in the show. Past couple seasons, you haven't really, you kind of forget, like, oh, all right, Tyrion was, and Peter Dinklage's performance were the best parts of the show in the earlier seasons, where he hasn't had much to do, much, hasn't had that important of dialogue with substance until, I guess, this scene with Cersei this whole season. And, a, and with Daenerys in that room when they're talking about the wheel, I thought that was another great scene. But this, when you see Lena Headey and Peter Dinklage go toe-to-toe in that, that emotional scene, I thought it was probably the best, the best acted scene this season. Tyrion said something to Cersei that made Cersei pledge her forces to Jon and Daenerys. People were speculating maybe he told her about Daenerys not being able to have kids and that their child, Cersei and Jaime's child, could be Daenerys' successor that he promised them that, that that it will further their line, continue their uh, dynasty when they're done. But that's not breaking the wheel. And if you that's what you think Tyrion... Well, it's playing the game. Okay. Oh, yeah, your kid can have the throne, sure. <laughs> and that's why when he he was overlooking Jon and Daenerys on the that final scene on the boat, he seemed concerned. There's a lot of different ways that you can interpret it. That's This is just one theory. I don't really see Tyrion trying to work with Cersei or Cersei necessarily trying to tr- Cersei necessarily trusting Tyrion. Well, she didn't. Yeah. I so mean. they both probably were trying to play their own game and then and then just completely being like, "Yeah, fuck that. I'm going to do my own thing." What do you think about the look at that on that final scene? I think what I said in the finale, I think I think I still believe is that Tyrion thinks that he's probably the best person to keep Daenerys in check especially after what he witnessed on the Field of Fire, her making the decision to burn the Torleys. He mentions in that Cersei scene that when Cersei brings up the fact that you said you had to stop her from burning down King's Landing, and he's like, well, I'm there to keep her in check, that he truly believes that is keeping Daenerys from rash decisions and going completely mad queen. And when he sees Jon and Daenerys together, maybe he feels like he'll be left out and then it's if Jon and Daenerys get together and, and they're both ruling Westeros that he's kind of left out as an, his advisory role and maybe makes him feel less important. You also brought up the fact that maybe the people aren't going to rally to Jon instead of Daenerys because it is a patriarchal society and they're going to want a king instead of a queen. They could have both. Who's really the, the power in that relationship? I think that's an interesting storyline if there wasn't this threat beyond the wall because that's where the story is going. It's not going to be about the politics of king versus queen. Yeah, but, until Tyrion finds out about Rhaegar. <laughs> well, talk <laughs> about making things fucking messy and complicated. He's become a glorified uh, Varys. And that's another thing. When you have all these great characters coming together, all these main characters with so much stuff to do and to get to that you don't have as much time as as much time on Tyrion as you would have in seasons past where you can go where each character can have their own storyline now he's involved with Jon's storyline and Daenerys where he plays a supporting role you stand in the presence of Daenerys Stormborn of House Targaryen rightful heir to the Iron Throne rightful queen of the Andals and the First Men protector of the Seven Kingdoms the mother of dragons the Khaleesi of the Great Grass Sea, the Unburnt, the Breaker of Chains. This is Jon Snow. He's king in the north. 
Well, I mean, the theme of this show kind of has been the duality of personalities, and two personalities that spent most of the season together were John and Daenerys. They don't get together until episode three, and that introduction to me was going back and doing the rewatch. That is a great scene when they're first introducing each other, and Daenerys is talking about how she kept going because she has faith in Daenerys Targaryen, not in any gods, not in any lords, but in herself. And Jon Snow, the introduction when Daenerys is giving all her names, and he looks towards Davos, and Davos is like, Jon Snow, he's uh, king in the north since the last season. Did you did you miss it? <laughs> uh, it's just I love I really enjoyed the dynamic between the two characters. I didn't like the romance. Well, I think when you look at Jon and Daenerys, Daenerys kind of has the sense of entitlement that she deserves to have the crown of Westeros and that it's hers for the taking. And anyone that thinks otherwise is an enemy. When you look at Jon in a leadership perspective, he's doing it because he feels he has to. That the Northerners elected him to do so and he has to do everything he can to protect the North and to do what's right. It's not as self-motivated as Daenerys. I think that's what makes Jon's character great and I think that's what eventually leads to the ending when he eventually kneels is that he's trying to do the best for his people. The scene that I love is when they're overlooking the dragons at Dragonstone, and it's the scene where Daenerys allows Jon to mine the dragon glass caves. I forget what Daenerys says, but Jon responds, oh, you've been talking to Tyrion. He talks a lot. And Daenerys says, we all love to do what we're good at. And Jon says, I don't. I think that triggered in her head. Uh, it kind of reminds me of the stories I've heard about Rhaegar. Zaris never told you. He told me Rhaegar was good at killing people. Rhaegar never liked killing. That Jon is great at commanding men, he's great at leading men, he's great at killing men, but that's not something that he loves to do. He's, I, I say it all the time as a joke, but he is the George Washington of Game of Thrones. He's a great leader, but he's not looking to lead. That's not his ambition, like you said. He doesn't want to be king. He doesn't care who sits on the Iron. It doesn't matter whose skeleton sits on the Iron Throne. Like you said, that's why I love this character. And I think Daenerys has that in her as well, and I think we saw that in this season, especially her decision to help Jon beyond the wall. Well, yeah, I think with Daenerys, you got a little bit of a change halfway through the season as far as looking at the big picture. Her whole life, she's been focused on getting back to Westeros and her family retaking the Iron Throne. Up until, I guess, the beginning of the series, at the end of season one, she puts it upon herself to do so and feels like she has to take this. Because right, I, I think I don't, Daenerys I don't, is trying to live up to the family name. It's, it's Yes, because I don't think she necessarily has to do it, but I think she feels like she, she has it's to. It's her purpose at yeah. this point. I Where, think if you really asked Daenerys, what do you want? She would have been, I think she I think she's more Jon Snow than what people make her out to be. Yeah, I mean, I think. Just chilling She probably would have stayed a Marine if it wasn't for you're the last Targaryen. You had to take back Westeros. It's your birthright. The house with the red door. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, that's really all she wants. Right. That's, I mean, when you go into her head, that's really at the end of the day. She just wants a home. I mean, when you have three dragons and you can get the best home, might as well go for it, right? They put their differences aside. They work together, John and Daenerys. And one plot line that you did not like in this season is the effort to bring Cersei and the Lannisters into the fold by showing them a white. You thought it was just stupid. Yeah, Tyrion brings up the plan to bring Cersei into the fold, that they need all seven kingdoms working together to fight the Great Other. But I think even Cersei says it at the end. She's like, if dragons can't beat them, what the fuck are we going to do? I feel like it's Tyrion so true. I think Tyrion should have known, especially the opinion he has of his sister, that she really shouldn't give a fuck about this. Right. And I get that. And are they really going he to does, make a difference? He does kind of understand. He tries to talk to Jamie, and Jamie can convince her. He's got to know that Jamie does not wear the pants in that relationship. <laughs> no, no. <laughs> I mean, at the end of the day, Cersei's going to help one person, and that's Cersei and her family. Yeah, he wears the pants until she yanks them off and says, get in bed, you stupid bitch. That's just my fan fiction. <laughs> <laughs> oh, you guys can find that at thenerdsoup.com. I mean, the plan... I mean, let's face it, the plan was to get a dragon to the White, but, to right. the White Knight's King. Isn't there a better way to do that? There's so many different... Isn't other- it just, okay, John, I'm starting to believe in you. Let's just go north together. We don't need to do this stupid White plan. Who cares what they believe in? Well, the simplest thing would be, John... Or maybe surprise us. Maybe they could have been like, okay, we're, let's talk to Cersei. Let's see if, if we can get their armies to fight with us. And then the White just pops up. They caught it off screen. They've, they've had this in the back pocket. And that would have been a great moment. Like, what the fuck? When did they get that? Like, oh, whites were south of the wall. We caught one. That's it. You don't Uh, have to make it an entire plot line for the show. There's definitely other ways you could have done it. I think the clear, when you talk to most people, why they didn't like the Beyond the Wall episode, it was because of the whole point of that whole episode was to get the Night's King a dragon. And right, yeah. there's so many other ways you could have done it because it felt it really did feel sloppy, rushed, and 
not well put together. The logic was there was a lot of flawed logic of character decisions that we know they wouldn't make or they shouldn't have made, but they did anyway. As far as it pertains to Daenerys and John, because it did happen. <laughs> I mean, no, no many other way, different ways we wanted to happen or it, it's sh- canon should have been happened. It's there. It's in stone. I guess Daenerys's decision to help John was one of I'm tired of sitting back. She alludes to it earlier. Don't sit back. Don't let all this stuff happen. I can make a difference. And I think at this point she kind of sympathizes with John. Kind of probably starting to fall in love with him a little bit and realizes that I can help. So goes north of the dragons and then loses one. <laughs> yeah. Well, I talked about that I love the dynamic between John and Daenerys and that would almost make me sound like a hypocrite because I don't like the romance. I you, like the dynamic as them as partners. As them as, yeah, Working together. As them basically as world leaders. Right, yeah. With opposing views but still on the same side. Uh, a team of rivals almost that come together, they join their armies. The romance to me, they just don't have chemistry together as as people that would be romantically linked. The characters are, are so similar to me in a way that it, it doesn't make sense to match them together. Yeah, I remember um, you alluded to Ygritte and John, how there was such opposites that made for a great relationship right? and fun to watch on screen. I agree with you totally. When they're opposing, not opposing, but when they're not in a romantically involved, I think their scenes were much better. I think the first real scene we get is when John bends the knee and Daenerys sees her. When Daenerys sees him on the boat in bed, they have that little moment where they're lingering their hands together. And she kind of pulls back. Yeah. <laughs> Very romantic. And John bends the knee, allegedly. <laughs> well, not allegedly, but like <laughs> in principle. Well, he he bent the knee back in episode three in right. the cave. Fact, fact. But the decision to bend the knee... Um... It's not out of character for John. I believe, I mean, if you go back to the Beyond the Wall episode, when Tormund's talking to John about Mance's decision and how he was arrogant to a fault that he let all those people die just because he didn't want to bend the knee. And I think that got to John a little where he's kind of in the same situation where it's not about who rules the North or if he's king or not. It's about the North being held together and the people not being slaughtered by White Walkers. And it was a little, uh, Daenerys saw them and she knew what was coming. So he probably didn't have to bend the knee for her to help him. Yeah, he didn't have to bend the knee. So, I mean, that should have been a dick move for Daenerys if she didn't help after seeing that. So, I guess that's... Yeah, at that point, it just becomes about survival, like John has always been saying. If you take away that plan to get the white, I think you could make the argument that this storyline was the strongest of season seven. But I I would still lean towards Cersei and Jaime. Yeah, definitely. I mean, I don't don't hate the romantic stuff as much as you do. I think that... Hate it. Yeah, no. Can't stand it. Yeah, we know. It's disgusting. We we told you. Not even the incest. (laughs) Fine with that. It's inevitable, though. I'm a Jonza guy. Oh, my God. That's gross. Why? They're cousins. What's the difference? This is fucking Ant. Cousins is much worse. Cousins is worse? Yes. Really? Okay. Put it on the poll. Nerd Soup giveaway. <laughs> I don't know how this is a giveaway. <laughs> but put it on the poll. Some stats? Cousins or Ant? Nephew. What's worse? He doesn't... First of all, he doesn't know it's his Ant, and they're just meeting for the first time. Actually, I'm not even Jonza. I'm Jaria. That's fucking worse. That's disgusting. You should be ashamed of yourself. Bon? Joran? When the snows fall and the white winds blow, the lone wolf dies, but the pack survives. I miss him. Now, one of the bigger, I guess, surprises this season was the relationship between Sansa and Arya. At first, I thought it was going to be the conflict between Jon and Sansa, as I thought Littlefinger was trying to gear Sansa to rule the North, which he was. We all know Jon goes south, and Arya comes to Winterfell, and that's who she has the conflict with. Yeah, I don't think either of us anticipated this in our previews at all. I don't think we thought Sansa and Arya would have a conflict. I mean, there's a conflict between them in the earlier seasons, which kind of makes sense because they're so different. That's more just sisters being complete opposites at a young age right this is more political and both their paths have been through previous seasons they're just but two you completely think different people that these paths have made them have brought them closer 
in terms of their personality, the way that they're ruthless towards their enemies. Because I think Sansa has a little bit of Arya in her now as well. I mean, that first episode when Jon and Sansa have that argument over who should they give the new castles to, or the old castles to, Sansa talks about how she learned a lot from Cersei. You would think that these characters would be on the same page after all that they've been through, saying, okay, we're the last remaining Starks, let's take out our enemies together. Think about Sansa's storyline, this whole series, it's been very up and down and a little inconsistent. Starts off down, then when you finally see her with Littlefinger and she's starting to learn the game at the Vale, that's the kind of Sansa I wanted to see. Then you had the whole season five mess. It really takes until the last episode for her to start actually doing it on her own, playing the game. Well, we talk about it all the time, the decision for Littlefinger to sell Sansa to the Boltons. If they just don't do that in season five, it would add more to the story where Sansa would have a reason to keep Littlefinger around, where she could say, okay, Littlefinger might be somebody that you cannot trust, but he saved my life and he taught me how to play the game. He basically mentored me at the Vale. Now, I I do have a a hard choice here. Do I choose Arya, somebody that I haven't seen for years, or do I choose my father figure? And I think that's a choice she's going to have to make in the books, and I hate saying, I hate being the the in-the-book guys, but let's just embrace it. We're the the in-the-book guys. That's... (laughs) Yeah, <laughs> we're like blues could do in the books. It's just now in season seven, the way that they developed the conflict between Arya and Sansa and the inevitable death of Littlefinger at the end of the season. It just I think we all expected him to die at the end of the season, that he was the major guy that was going to basically kick the can. But it was all over the place. They tried to like surprise us, but it wasn't. It was a very I mean, anticlimactic. I scene. figured it out, but it wasn't really like. Oh, snap, Littlefinger. I was like, all right, I kind of get it, but it kind of came out of nowhere, but... It wasn't as clever as it could have been. I wanted to see Sansa play the game against Littlefinger, go along with him, playing the long con, realizing what he's trying to do, and then switch it up on him. I feel like all the good stuff from that storyline was happened off screen. In the season seven arc, it's basically her playing Littlefinger for one episode, when yeah. she does that whole scene in uh, episode seven. This was probably the worst... I like worst... to play a little game with people. This is probably the worst part of the season, the Winterfell storyline. Yeah, I think it was very uninteresting to watch. It was nice to see Arya reunite with her family. I think the best scene with Arya was probably the opening scene of the season. And it's not even Maisie Williams in that scene. It's David Bradley who plays, who used to play Walder Frey. And he does a great job with the mannerisms and the expression. Just the way he's speaking to his Frey men. That you it, could tell that it's not Walder Frey in that body. Yeah, the Sansa and Arya stuff where you think, oh, like there's no reason for this conflict. It's completely senseless. It's baseless. And then you see them come together at the end when they finally do put Littlefinger down, you're like, oh, maybe they've been playing them the whole time. Okay, that's pretty cool. Uh, nope. <laughs> they go to Bran and Bran tells. No, yeah. They and just, Bran has to tell them. They went like, to their supercomputer. So it's basically like leaving that out is a better decision because it makes us think, oh, well, maybe Arya and Sansa were smart, smarter than what they showed this whole time and were able to figure it out. No, they weren't and it was just pointless conflict. Well, they could have showed it from both sides. They could have made it where Arya's on one side, Littlefinger's on the other, and Sansa's in the middle and they're both tugging her in each direction, but they they kind of kept it to these individual scenes that they would have in certain episodes and tried to trick the audience into believing that Sansa and Arya would betray each other. The last scene for a character like Littlefinger, who he's not necessarily a major player, but he's the best player. He's kind of that guiding hand that has pushed these different pieces to where they really are now. To see him go out like that without I mean, even a fair trial, it just seemed... It wasn't even a good last game for him to play. It was such a bad thing. plan. It really doesn't do anything with the note. It was so like convenient that... Every Everything fell like it wasn't a great last plan. Like I wanted to see Littlefinger his last go try to take the Iron Throne, you know? Try to take the North from Sansa or do something like that. Picture of me on the Iron Throne. And you by my side. But it was to try to set Arya and Sansa against each other because that helps out. Right, and I'm somebody who defends the arc with Arya where she goes to Bravos and she trains with the Faceless Assassins because I thought it was interesting. I always I think the Faceless Assassins are so mysterious and they really represent the magical territory of Game of Thrones. But it seems that those powers that she acquired in Bravos aren't really coming into play anymore. She had the one opening scene which was fantastic, but incorporate that in Season 7 in the game against Littlefinger. You find yes, a clever way Arya, to use that. Have Arya using faces of Stark advisors or Stark men and like listening to Littlefinger's plans, gathering intel, going undercover, using her skills, becoming a detective. Becoming Batman, like she yeah. trained to be. To go through all of that and make your way home again only to find such chaos in the world. I can only imagine. Chaos is a ladder. (laughs) 
So Brandon Stark, a.k.a. the Professor X of Game of Thrones, a.k.a. the Dr. Manhattan, he's kind of similar to Arya in the sense where in season four, that's the last time we saw him before he came back in season six, that he was going to train with the Three-Eyed Raven to really explore his powers as a Green Seer, as a warg. And those powers in season six, they revealed that Lyanna Stark is Jon Snow's mother. In season seven, we had the big reveal at the end of the season that Rhaegar Targaryen, in fact, married Lyanna, and so it makes Jon a legitimate Targaryen. But he's not really doing anything in terms of helping them defeat the White Walkers. He sent the Raven to John about them marching on Eastwatch very slowly. Yeah, I thought he would have more of a role to play this season, not only telling us about John and Rhaegar and how John's the rightful king of Westeros. I thought he would have more to do with the White Walkers and learning more about what they want, what their origins are, how to defeat them. Right, and I wonder if we're going to get that in the book. Do you think that's how George reveals, not necessarily all of it, but little hints? I mean, with Bran, I think, I feel like that would take precedent over finding out who John was, or the whole season he's saying, I need to talk to John, I need to tell him something, even not knowing the full extent of the story. I thought he would, you know, when the army of the dead's coming close, I figured we would get a glimpse into the past, how they started, how did the children and the men beat them at first. Maybe we get scenes flashback of the battle of the first great war. Yeah, just hints. You yeah, know? I think in the books we'll definitely get more hints. I think it'll be more vast, more detailed of what Bran can see in the past. Definitely different scenarios playing out as far as the Age of Heroes and all that good stuff. I'm kind of disappointed we didn't get that. Bran kind of just didn't really do much, and his character changed. His personality was a little abrupt for me as well. When we're first introduced to him in this season, he's kind of a totally different person than when we see him last. Yeah, he's kind of indifferent to human emotions, and he doesn't have a personality anymore. And the transition from the old brand to the new brand is absent in the show. There hasn't been any transition. Because the last time we saw him in season six, you can kind of see hints of it where he he tells Mira, I'm the three-eyed raven now. But now he's just completely emotionless, and the transition has come out of nowhere. I get it. I mean, when you... No, it makes sense, but there's no development to that point. So I understand, like, seeing all this history and just being surrounded by all these different events. He's so woke. He's extra woke right now. Except about Rhaegar. He didn't know that. Yeah, but I think that makes sense. Why is Samwell Tarly the only guy that he got excited to see? It's like, Arya, eh, Sansa, whatever. Samwell (laughs) Tarly, would you look who it is, you old whippersnapper. (laughs) How's the Citadel? Every time I see Sam, I'm like, ah, fuck, I have to watch this for five minutes. Yeah, he's the only (laughs) one who likes Sam. Yeah, but his character is interesting because his powers are really, like the Faceless Men I said before, it's that magical territory of Game of Thrones that we don't get to see a lot, but that's why I I really love the brand chapters in the book as well, because you get to explore some of the past, and you get to explore what it means to be a green seer and a warg. It's like Sansa and Arya. What he did in this season, he, he led to the execution of Littlefinger, and that's it, really? But the way they played it out, it's like they wanted to make it a big finale at the end where Bran should know this already, or he should have said something. He and then he told us about something that we all knew for years. It's, I mean, like, it's cool to see it play out on screen and to have it actually confirmed, but we knew that. Yeah, I mean, that, that was his big moment this season, right? So it was kind of, it wasn't underwhelming, but it was kind of given that we would see that. With Bran, it's, it's difficult to say because we don't know the extent of what he can do yet or what what is his role to play going forward. But I feel like they're skipping over parts they should have alluded to in this season just to make it for the finale, the final season, uh, just so they can have those big moments where Bran finds out how to beat the White Walkers or see something in the past. List of priorities, that's number one. <laughs> you should go back and see. Is it not the White Walkers? List of priorities. Hmm. Let's go back and look at that little finger Varys conversation from season three. <laughs> Bran, shouldn't we check about the White... No! I want to see Aiden Gillen and Conleth Hill act. But what about John? I have big news about John. Oh, what is it? Is no, he's it some, a bastard. Is it something he's a huge? Sand. <laughs> yeah. But no, this is, this is big stuff. Yeah, this is big. Bad night to be outdoors. You've got real powerful magic to figure that out. Did the Lord of Light whisper that in your ear? It's snowing, horse. It's windy. It's gonna be a cold night. You're a grouchy old bear, aren't you, Clegane? You want some rum? Don't mind that shit. It's too sweet. Why are you was in such a foul mood? Experience. So the return of the Hound in season six, one of the best episodes, whenever you have Ian McShane play a character in your show, he's going to steal every scene that he's in. And we kind of see this redemption arc for the Hound where he joins the Brotherhood Without Banners and they convince him that there is a greater war that needs to be fought. And this is how you can redeem all the blood that you have on your on your ledger. 
so to speak. And in season seven, I think in the first episode, the scenes with the Brotherhood and the Hound were some of the best scenes of the season. Yeah, definitely better character moments, I would say, between the Hound. Like, you have so many, like, great characters with different backgrounds and experiences. And to see the Hound in that scene at the cabin where he shows remorse for the family that he met earlier with Arya really does kind it's of... It's heartbreaking. Yeah, it's... I don't even think the Hound realizes, like... I feel like he was thinking inside, like, why do I feel this inside? Well, the Hound really hates the way that the world works. He says to Beric, he says, if there was any justice in the world, you'd be dead, and that little girl would be alive. When Tormund says to him later in the season that you have sad eyes, the Hound is somebody who has become not necessarily a nihilist, but he's become a misanthrope because he hates the way that this world works and it treats the people that are the middle class, the common folk. And I love the nod, obviously, to the Gravedigger. We don't know if he is the Gravedigger in the books, but I think he's the Gravedigger in the books. Well, it's, it's, <laughs> and I think it's Vengeance nice. Cold Hands. It's funny, too, because, like, even if he's not, it'll be a nice little D&D, like, ah, I got you guys. Yeah, yeah fuck you, George. Yeah. <laughs> you guys hate our show? Well, <laughs> well Benjamin's cold hands. <laughs> uh, but just from when we first see the Hound in season one, our first introduction to the kind of person he is when he kills the Butcher's Boy. He seems very one note. Yeah, and at that point, like, we're obviously Stark fans, and Ned's visibly disgusted by the act, so you, you right. immediately say, oh, the Hound, who's this guy? He sucks. Like, he's a terrible person. We see him now, and he's sympathizing with this, this young family to the point where he would actually bury him, and he's visibly shaken up about it. That's, that's one of the best scenes, is comedy moments when... <laughs> right, and Beyond the Wall as well. <laughs> you cunt. Everything's a cunt yeah, Everything's a hound. cunt in that one. But uh, I think this episode set up something that I was anticipating very much when eventually John would take the Brotherhood and some of his men beyond the wall and they would face the Night King and his army. That scene when he's looking into the flames and he talks about how he sees the wall, he sees the Night King, he sees their army at Eastwatch, it set up something that really didn't pay off when it did happen. That episode could have been better, but those characters, I just love those characters, so I'm glad that they got their big moments to fight on the side of the living. Yeah, Beric's making it a lot further than I thought he would. <laughs> yeah, oh, well, yeah, right. Alas he Thoros. dies like a couple of months into his introduction in the book, right? Yeah, I He's mean... He's dead at, within his first the appearance. book three, yeah. Yeah. The Kiss of Life, I thought maybe would happen this year. It seems like, uh, I'll see you again, Hound. Who knows? Hound, Mountain... Zombie Clegane Bowl, maybe. Uh, I thought I we were gonna get complain. I thought we were. I thought we were gonna get a Clegane. I can't say that word. You can't say Clegane Bowl, man. You can't I never say could. It. You really can't. You have to think it. I think we're gonna see a Clegane. <laughs> you have to say it in French first. That's Clegane. how Stuttering Bill did it. Really? Yeah, he says it in French, and then it comes. How, how do you say like, Clegane in French? Avoir Clegane Ball. I don't know. It's kind of just English. I thought we were gonna see a Clegane Ball at the. I thought we were gonna see a Clegane Ball at the end of the season. There you go. Yeah. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. Thank you. This is all going in. Oh, the, I wouldn't have it any other way. You like, thought you were gonna see it we at didn't the end see of the it, season. Yeah, yeah and the season, season eight. Little. Season eight. Hopefully, and is, no, the, is the wall coming down? Quick, a little more on the hound. At, on quick. God, I can't talk today. I think I saw it, and I fucking. Yeah. <laughs> I'm picking that up from the guy. Also in the finale with the Hound, like his little moment with Brienne too when they're reflecting about Arya. I thought that was fantastic. And his little uh, quip to his brother. The Hound and Brienne were like proud parents. Like our little girl's gone on to become a faceless assassin. <laughs> oh, we taught her well, didn't we? And you kicked my ass. <laughs> Fuck you. <laughs> and now it's what you've all been waiting for, the Nerd Soup giveaway. Who's walking away with a t-shirt, a mug, and a Amazon gift card? Well, here's the picture that we had in our Season 7 finale review. And here it is. The faces behind the characters finally revealed. The magic is gone. <laughs> <laughs> Just want to say a quick thank you to everybody who participated in the giveaway. We had a lot of people write in suggestions, but we have five winners. But before we announce that, I just want to do a quick shout out to our Patreon supporters. These are people who have contributed to our Patreon page over the last couple of months. You really have no idea how much this helps the channel grow. And now for the winners, our five winners. So here you go. Congratulations, guys. We're going to need you to message us on our YouTube channel so we can get the proper information to send you all the little prizes that you've won. So once again, congratulations. Thank you for participating. And thank you to all the people who subscribed to our channel during the Season 7 run of Game of Thrones. It's been a great honor to have all these people who subscribe, they like the videos, they comment, they give us positive feedback. It's really, it feels like a community. So thank you again. We love doing this. And be on the lookout for our next Game of Thrones video. It's going to be a theory video and it's going to concern Rhaegar Targaryen as... The prince that was promised. Ooh, look at that. We're making a new theory.